from Music for All and presented by Yamaha. It's teaching social emotional learning through music. A practical web series for all music educators, embedding SEL into music education. On this episode, we welcome composer and educator Jody Blackshaw. Please welcome our host of teaching social emotional learning through music, Scott Edgar. Hi, everybody. Welcome to our next episode of Teaching Social and Emotional Learning Through Music. We had so much fun with today's guest when we had her as part of our panel for the Horizon Leans Forward group that we wanted to come and talk to Jody Blackshaw some more. So coming to us from Australia, Jody, thanks so much for joining us today. You're welcome, Scott. It's really, really great to talk to you again because I think you and I have have a lot in common and I uh, I can't wait to see what what we get into today it'd be great oh Jody it's beautiful you know it's one of those things that you know you and I had not met prior to a couple of months ago and it's like where have you been all my life <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's so powerful and you know when we, we had a, a separate conversation Jody you said shine bright to find mm-hmm. your people that we need to shine bright and put it out there and that's where we know that hey Jody's in Australia. We're doing this work here, and, and, and that's that connective tissue. Mm, yeah. So, Jody, we know from uh, our previous conversation, but we know that really at its heart, you've been doing social and emotional learning for decades. You haven't called it that. So, can you translate a little bit of some of the work that you've done over the last decades that says, this is social and emotional learning, and this is how we can start to get it into our band classrooms. Yeah, I, I'd really love to. Um, my background is is a little bit different to most, where I did a, a Bachelor of Music in Composition. So I started as a composer. I didn't start in teaching, but my father and my grandmother were both teachers. Um, my grandmother in particular was a remarkable teacher, a really extraordinary teacher and primary school teachers in in her day were very, very strong with music. So she ran a lot of choirs and, um, uh, you know, she had that Pied Piper effect where she would be in the playground and all the kids would be following her around and a really extraordinary woman. Um, my father was very much the same. He, he, he very much saw the world through the eyes of the child and, and was always uh, appealing to them through through their eyes and doing things that that really got the child involved, uh, and I think I, I I always lived in schools. My dad was um, principals of primary schools, so we'd live in the school residence, and sometimes that was a one or two teacher school. So you're in these tiny little places, but schools were very familiar to me. Um, but even so, I went and did a bachelor of music in composition uh, when I was straight out of high school. Uh, And then I went and taught back in a country town because being from a very remote um, country area where there wasn't a lot of music, I had to do music by correspondence in high school and and, um, uh, even clarinet lessons by correspondence, (laughs) uh, all those kind of things. Um, I really wanted to make sure that I at least at one point in my life gave back to to country kids and gave them something that maybe they wouldn't get um, otherwise. I was very inexperienced. I really didn't have much of an idea of what I was doing. But during those formative years for me, I spent a lot of time working with students one-on-one. So I really, really uh, got to know what makes them tick. I really got to know what makes them invested. And um, really, and a, a lot of people listening out there will know this, that music teachers are uh, are counsellors, they're mentors, they're, um, they're, 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 they become dear friends, they become very trusted uh, adults um, in the lives of a child. And for me, you know, that was, I started to realise that getting them to unpack things creatively in their lessons, not only help develop their skill set on their instrument, and I'm doing this because it was a clarinet, not only develop that skill set, but you started to learn more about them and then they became more invested and then they became more attached with what they did and then they were then able to apply that to other things and everything just started to you know grow and evolve as this really big beautiful flower you know uh, that was that was uh, its own ecosystem and and then eventually you as the teacher you can step away you, you can completely step out of that 
and give them that independence and awareness of themselves and independence in their own learning and then foster that lifelong love of, of music in that in that particular child. So then what, what grew from there was you do that in that one-on-one -on -one setting and then you do it in smaller ensembles and then you start to larger ensembles and then for us here in Australia, a large proportion of what we do in as a music teacher is classroom music. So then, then that extends to classroom music as well. And um, the whole time, my focus and what I do is always still seeing things through the eyes of a child uh, and really trying to ensure that they were socially and emotionally invested in, in what they were doing. I didn't realise that that's what I was actually doing, but that was completely what they were doing. And I physically find it traumatic if I can't teach that way. I, I, I've now got to a point where, you know, I found the different tools that enabled me to make that happen. I discovered Orff Schulwerk about 20 years ago, and that was a massive game changer for me. I was moving in that direction anyway, but then when I discovered it and the way I learned Orff Schulwerk was that I was very much in control of what I did. I could create a lot of my own resources. So me as the teacher remained creative. I, create, I remained socially and emotionally invested in what I was doing that then fed and, and um, uh, you know, was imparted in my teaching. Uh, and so then my students were learning, were learning that way as well. So yeah, my background is a little bit different, but it's, it's very much been that way. And then when I started running my own concert bands, um, I started, uh, I was collecting a lot of uh, compositions by students and, and a lot of those uh, compositions were, you know, I had a fourth grade clarinet, te uh, clarinet student and, and she wrote a piece called Hair Washing Blues because she hated washing her hair, <laughs> you know, it was this great little piece um, that was based on this little blues scale, uh, you know, it went down to a low G on clarinet. So she was learning her low notes on clarinet, it got her playing that. So then I turned that into a, a chart for band. You know, I had this, um, well, uh, another student, I have to share this story, playing saxophone, beginner saxophone, and she could um, play four notes, C, B, A, and G, and, you know, go and, you know, play, uh, create a song for me. She creates this funky, funky little tune. And I said, so what have you called it? And she goes, oh, oh it doesn't really have a name. All I know is that it really annoys the cat. <laughs> So, so we called it, it really annoys the cat. And that's just what we called it. And then we, I arranged it for the little ensemble she played in, which was a bass guitar and a few other groups. And we added these funky little lines and the students are so invested. Um, and then, you know, and then what you do is you learn another chart and, you, and, you know, that's written by somebody who really knows what they're doing. And you say, hey, look, this composer has used the same kind of things that you've done. And they've used the same kind of, um, components that you've done and the way that I arranged it, we've done this and this and this. Um, and look, you're thinking like a composer, you're invested in that same musical journey. And of course, you know, that ecosystem I was talking about, that ecosystem, wow, it starts to rain abundantly and then there's abundant sunshine and everything just grows, everything just grows to its full strength and its full capability and blooms the brightest you could ever see it bloom. So for me throughout my life, I've wanted to find out, well, why? <laughs> why does that happen? Why is it so powerful? And how can I get that experience into everything that I do? Not just a one-on-one -on -one situation, not just a tiny little band, you know, but in, in my mandatory music classrooms, in, in, in big, huge, large ensembles, how do I make that happen? And I guess that's why I have the body of work behind me that I do. Jody, unbelievable. And, you know, I, 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 I commiserate with hair washing blues. I mean, I, I totally <laughs> understand where, where that one was going. Uh, and, you know, your experiences with music by correspondence, I wonder mm -hmm. if that was the first training ground for what we had to do during mm -hmm. the pandemic, you know, it was yeah. a little bit of that. But, you know, in, in all seriousness, it, it really does come down to how well do we know our kids and the relationships mm. that we build. Yeah. You know, I, I want to ask you to dig just a little bit deeper because I, what you said, the teacher needs to step away. 
And I, I think that oftentimes, whether it be through the models that we've been given or whether how we go through teacher education programs, that it's all about what is our role in the classroom. And I, I, I think when I hear you speak, and, and certainly aligns with my beliefs, that it's more about how do we take a step back so that the students can take a step forward. Yeah, we're a facilitator, not a dictator. Uh, 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 yeah, it's it's just so incredibly important. Um, I'm known as the lady who tells you to get off the podium uh, rather, rather than staying on it. Uh, and I think it's so important to give skills to students and and just just you know hold back and see what happens and see what they do you know i just love it when um in 2012 i presented bella sun woman at the midwest clinic and i worked with chip de stefano at um, mccracken middle school in chicago and they were my band to come and work with me for that clinic I had no idea what kind of gold I was given by the Midwest Clinic for them assigning to me that school. Chip is great and the students were just spectacular. And I'll never ever forget when I went and did a workshop with them on the first movement, which is the chair and stick movement of Bella Sun Woman. And um, I got them to recompose. You know, I've written my own version of it. But um, there's four main phrases in Bella Sun Woman and you divide the band into four groups and you split them off and you say, find your own way to play it on the chair. Just just go and, uh, you know, use that same rhythm, but your own way to play it on the chair. And I'll give you, you know, oh, 10 minutes or so, then I'll get you to come back. Room looks like chaos, just looks like chaos. And, and Chip is pacing up and down, you know, just going, oh, you know, like really freaking out as to what the room looks like, because it's not structured. And it's not everybody sitting in neat little chairs. There's kids everywhere. And it, and he, and he, re, I've heard him retell the story and say, it just, you know, they weren't doing anything. And then suddenly 10 minutes later, righto, let's go, let's come back, let's come back. Okay, group one, show me what you've got. Group one, instantly, bam, go in and play it in unison perfectly in their own image. And I thought he was gonna have a heart attack. Like he just, he couldn't believe, he just couldn't believe it. I said, and, and talking to him later, he said, I just thought they weren't doing anything. I said, no, this is how kids do stuff. They're messy, they're messy learners. And sometimes you've just got to hold back and let the mess happen. And sometimes the mess happens and it comes back and yeah, they haven't done very much. But there'll be other groups that have, and they'll see that. And then the next time you do it, they'll go, yeah, we need to use our time more effectively this time. And then you'll do it again. And yeah, we're going to do it more effectively this time. So you can't expect, you can't try and teach in this kind of way and expect it to be perfect the first time, especially if they don't do it anywhere else in their school. If they don't learn this way anywhere else in their school and their creativity has been shut down and I can talk to that a little bit deeper in terms of why, in terms of what that actually is. But if that's really been shut down, it's going to take you a while as the music teacher to re to refine. You're going to have to go digging for that creative self and show them that your music space is a safe place for them to be able to really show that whole self. Because when we ask them to show that that their that creative self, you know, that that's at the top of the chart. That's, or so many other levels of safety have to be in place before we'll be creative. Um, so we've really got to make sure that we've got this safe, gorgeous, luscious, non-competitive space that enables that child to feel, you know, emotionally good, socially connected, um, so that they can then really open up and, and be creative. And that takes time because what we're effectively doing is building trust. And a hundred percent. I love talking to you because it, it feels like you say things that are in my head and you articulate it in such a clean forward way. And I, I, I amazing when we talk about trust and, you know, I think in, in our world, I think we're talking about, that's probably one of the number one things we need to rebuild this fall when we get back into schools. Gosh, yes. Is that we just need to remind each other that it's okay to trust each other and mm. that we're not gonna get to any music ed if mm. we don't have that trust. 
thoughts on ways that we can rebuild that trust this fall? Uh, there's, there's just so many different, um, things that you can do. There's so many powerful things that you can do. Number one is chair and stick. <laughs> um, the reason I love chair and stick so much, um, is, and when I say chair and stick, it's like bucket drumming, I guess it's the same kind of thing. I love chairs because it's an everyday thing. I really love chairs that are maybe made of both wood and metal or plastic and metal because you get different colours and you can get different textures and different sounds out of the chair. But the main reason I love chair and stick is not only are you doing really rich, remarkable music education, students are learning through rhythm, they're learning through expressive techniques, through tone colour, through texture, through form, all, all of those kind of things, but everyone is equal. There's an equality about chair and stick because everyone's playing the same instrument everybody's doing the same thing and they're all playing the same thing and you as the teacher you are on the same level as those students so you can really create a lot of cohesion in your group and it's just fun you know it's it's joyful and it's fun it's loud it's a bit raucous you know um and if you still have to be socially distanced it's still going to work you know and and also you know there's no there's, there's no, none of those nasty flutes that, you know, are going to infect and disease the world apparently, you know, and those kind of things. So you, you're just, you know, working with drumsticks and if necessary, wear gloves, you know, if, if that's what helps or wipe down the sticks at the end, if, if that's something that your school needs to do. But it's a simple, effective and really dramatic way that you can instantly bring together a sense of team because you know trust trust and team are, are are right in there and let's be honest in the world of covid we've been taught to be an individual we've been we've basically said you need to keep away from everybody uh, pe people are going to make you sick you've got you, you you don't go don't go near people you know so we've got to break down those barriers and not only as we said talk about making it a safe place but really engendering trust so that is one way. Another way that you can do it, and uh, it's one of my most favourite things in the whole world to do, and it's called acting music. Um, and acting music comes um, from a, from a drama sense where, and some some people have seen me do this, where we we start with mirror movement. You're just doing from the waist up, and uh, you just mirror. So you find some some beautiful pieces. Uh, and, and you just trace the shape. You trace the shape of anything that you want to hear and you do it with a partner. And so you're just starting with a group of two. So you start, so you don't try and start with a big whole ensemble, you start with a group of two. And then, and then you grow that to a group of four and then you grow that to a group of eight and then and you start doing things. And, and what you do with acting music is you start by getting students to get their, they're analysing music on, on the fundamental music education level, they're analysing music through movement. That's what they're doing. So, but you can, you can have them do things and you can start with a 30 second excerpt and then go to a 50 second excerpt and then go to a, a minute 10 excerpt and you can get all the way up to two, three minutes. I've done it and I've done it with students who are not musically trained. We've done it over the span of 10 weeks but what they get at the end of it is are incredibly beautiful and incredibly um, connected and emotionally charged music making experiences. They're just not music making on an instrument. They're music making through their body. They're music making through their heart and their soul. And it's really, really, really powerful. And um, I'm happy to share with you a set of resources that, you know, just are writing out of how to get that started. And then in, in Bella Sunwoman, there's more information about that, but I'm happy to share that with you and you can put it in a link um, um, with this if teachers wanna know more, more about that and how to get started with that. Because that's completely non-verbal and it's, it can be distance and it can, it can be a way to really bring students together in an incredibly powerful and deeply emotional and personal way. Jody, so, so powerful. And I think that we will welcome those links and those links will appear uh, at the very end of our time together. You know, I think so much of this, I've heard you talk about this and we, we've started to sniff at this a little bit today, just about the value of play 
the value mm -hmm. of students just flirting with something mm -hmm. and getting to know. And, and for those people who really want to know where this comes from, I know you and I both have an affinity for Alfred Whitehead mm -hmm. and what that means in terms of skill and romance and contextualize. Mm -hmm. So can you dig into that a little bit for us and to get us all to dream about how that can be a central part of music education? Ah, oh, look, it's vital. The romance is vital. So, uh, you know, Whitehead talked about these sort of three, like the holy trinity of having a really balanced and really nutrient dense education experience for your students. And one is skill set. So, you know, really getting a good quality skill set. Because once you've got that foundation, once you've got that skill set, bam, you can do so much with it. But if, if you're applying it to a piece of technology, which is what a musical instrument is, then you've got, you know, it's like learning the software. Once you've learned the basics of the software, wow, you can create all sorts of things. And it's the same thing with an instrument. Yes, we've got to go through those method books. Yes, we've got to go through the, how do I get a beautiful sound? What, what is E? What is D? You know, we've got to do that. But for so many people, we only teach skill set. Like that's it. That's, that's what happens. And we're missing the other two parts of the Trinity to make it, um, you know, the most powerful form of education in the world, because that's what I actually really believe music is. And the other one, uh, romance and context. And these are these words used by Whitehead. And I love the word romance because it, it, it implies a swoon. It implies getting lost in it. It, it implies just losing yourself. It's flow all over again. You know, it, 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 that's exactly what it is. And it's where we allow our students to fail. It's where we give them the opportunity to work at what doesn't work. We, we seem to think that students don't are going to be put off by making mistakes. But have you ever played a video game? You know, how many times do they try and kill the baddie? You know, 117 before they finally kill the baddie? Kids are not afraid of doing it wrong, you know, lots of times. As long as they know what the end goal is, as long as the end goal is clear and in sight, They'll keep working till they get there. You know, they'll, they'll just keep at it. So um, that's where romance is so, so important. And as we know from many, many studies in neuroscience, we have to fail. We have to do things wrong in order to find the right pathway, in order to build the right highway in the brain to connect everything together. It, it, it's a fundamental part of how we learn. So the romance is really important and context is also just as important. And it's where hair washing blues comes in. It's where it really annoys the cat comes in. It's, it's about that child and it's about that child's life. We've got to hook in to their life. We've got to make music part of what they do. And that's what the teaching performance through composition um, resource is all about. That, that's what all of that stuff is about, is really getting the child to see how can I make this mean something to me? You know, rather than me just sitting there and being a button pusher, here I am on my tenor saxophone playing those tenor lines once again and being doubled by 17 other instruments in the band and feeling really unimportant, you know, how do we switch on that remarkable person? Because every life is remarkable. Every person is remarkable. Every student is remarkable. So how do we make sure that we don't lose them? How do we make sure that we, we shine a light on them? How, how do we make sure that every child gets the spotlight on them? For me, the answer is skill, romance and context, is the opportunity to break out of, of the large ensemble thing every now and then, break into smaller groups, do things in smaller groups, re rearrange things, you know, and you can do that still in a large ensemble. You can be in large ensemble and say, okay, you five over there, get together and have a chat. What, what do you think we should do next? You guys over there and, and set these little groups around. My colour wheel scores do the same thing. They divide large ensembles and break them into smaller groups that can then work together and discuss these kind of things and share these kind of things and have an impact on what the whole group is doing. And so they then feel invested, they feel connected and they feel safe. And, you know, I think that is exactly what so many of us are worried about right now. Mm -hmm. We're worried about how can we 
convince is too strong of a word, but how can we show our students and remind them that they love music? Because this last little bit, a lot of us have forgotten that we've loved music because it has been so difficult and it's the, the, that gratification hasn't been there. You know, Jody, you mentioned your your absolutely amazing resource, teaching performance through composition. And when when I received those copies in the mail and I was starting to thumb through it, I was like, SEL, SEL, SEL. But beyond that, it, this is a paradigm shift, Jody. This is a paradigm shift in how we can put the center uh, at the center of music education, the student, as opposed to deep yeah. <laughs> breath two three four no investment on that when i read this i was truly inspired jody can you tell us a little bit about that uh yeah and this the reason that people are struggle with it because is because it does take the focus away from the conductor it 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 does but you know it brings it back it's it's, it's a bit twofold it's it's asking you to 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 stand back, let the romance and contextualization happen, and you're just there facilitating, but then it comes back and, okay, we now have created this amazing performance piece. How do we get it to sound really good? Well, that's where me as the conductor comes in, you know. Uh, this is where we start to agree on how we're going to articulate, how we're going to phrase, how we're going to express. So it's, it's a little, it's a bit of give and take. And it's, I'm just asking band directors to let go for a little bit, but know that you don't let go. It's, it's not chaos, you know, you're still doing it in a very measured way, but you bring it back. So in teaching performance through composition, what we have is a resource that started with 13 moons and it's um, very much based on the whitehead that we were just talking about. So we have our skill set. So can I bring up a, Am I able to bring up a part or something? Am I able to do that? I believe you're good to go. Okay, so this is from uh, book two. Uh, and so this, this, this is a classic example of what a teaching performance through composition resource looks like. So as you'll see, when we think about skill sets, so here is a flute part and let's think about skill set. So the skill set here is what key are we in? Uh, and it shows what key are we in. We're in concert B flat. But in this case, what notes do we need to know to play? We don't need to know that whole scale. We really are talking about grade one players here. So you can see that they own, there's a three note melody. But as we know, there are students who go at different, different paces. You know, they learn it at different, at different levels. So there's also a five note melody. And that enables um, students who, who are, you know, those clarinet players who just rush ahead and learn 17 notes in the first term while our trombones are still struggling on four notes, you know, it enables them to go ahead. So then we have um, a three note melody and a five note melody. So here is our skill set. So our skill set talks about in a theoretical term, what key are we in? Because we all know, all know that key signatures are a pretty kind of esoteric um, kind of thing to teach what notes you need to know and then what you've got an example to do here is this is where some romance comes in is instead of saying okay everyone play the first note everyone play the next note you can just say now turn and talk to the person next to you and if there are any notes look at those notes if there are any in there that you're not sure of see if somebody else in your section knows how to play that note and if none of you know how to play that note hey can you work it out pull out your fingering chart can you work that out so rather than constantly being and having to go around the whole band and flutes, you need to do this and, and blah, you need to let the kids do it. Hold back, get off the podium and let them work it out for themselves. So then when they've got there, you can see that I've got these, um, and I've got these little lyrics under here, pear, pear, apple, pear, lime, lime. Now, the thing with these, these books, this is actually book two. In book one, uh, which I've got here, this is book one, number two. So this was book two, number two. Book one, number two, just teaches you the rhythm. And this is the chair and stick that I was talking to you about before. You can just learn this very, very simple rhythm uh, and it gives you an idea. And then, and you've got a few lesson plans here. So some ideas of how you can go through and do things, but essentially you are, you are getting students to compose with structure to start off with. So a tutti might be that, uh, everybody says this entire four measure rhyme and that's a tutti of everybody saying it. 
and then you might play it. So you might, you know, you know, pear, pear, apple, pear, lime, lime, apple, apple, pear, pear, apple, pear, lime, you know, that kind of thing. But then you can go around and you can actually divide your, your band into four sections and say you've got bar one, you've got bar two, you've got bar three, you've got bar four. Do something different with that rhythm, you know, and they might just go pear, pear, apple, pear. They might just do that. And the other, and then the next group might, instead of going, you know, um, they might go lime, lime or something like that, you know. Um, and then everybody learns each other's and we're connecting, we're playing around. As, as the groups are teaching each other, they're going to make mistakes because, wow, it's a huge memory thing to have to remember, you know, right on the spot. You're, sometimes you're improvising because, because the, the group hasn't done their work and right at the end they go, oh, we'll just do this and they make it up on the spot um, and then, and then you, you've got to go with that. So you'll see that you've already, if you do this in this order, you've already learned the rhythm. You've gone through this whole lesson just with rhythm and then you add pitch. So we're scaffolding the learning to, again, keep students feeling safe, make them trust the process because they're not being thrown under a bus and being asked to do something really difficult. And we also haven't thrown this music in front of them uh, straight away. So what, what you've got also here in book one is you've not only got all your lesson plans, blah, 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 but you've also got flashcards. So what you've got with these flashcards is you can really um, get students to become familiar with this notation. We're not expecting them to know it inside out, back to front at this point, but it's a familiarization. And then you also get, you know, a pretty stock standard kind of um, thing. Because I'm right into tactile, I think our students with computers and things, we're really getting away from how much we actually learn through the dexterity of our hands. Um, and this enables them to just write out uh, and these are sort of jumbled up and they, they write them out in their own order. So they really know this rhythm. They're really familiar with, um, with all of this kind of stuff so that when they go back to um, uh, this flip, their, you know, their part and we add pitch to this, this rhythm is okay. This, this rhythm isn't startling and the words are there to remind them that this is, this is the process they have already been through and now we're going to add pitch. And the boxes down the bottom here we might have let's do a tutti let's do a soli um, which might be a solo section you could do this in a duet in our three and five note melody this would actually work in a duet but you can also do them as a round so you start adding textual complexity you start adding musical independence you can do this as a whole band or if you had the space you can actually divide them into small groups get them to go off and create their own kind of composition and then come back and share that with each other and have a little performance. So yes, these, these aren't Mahler symphonies, you know, um, that's, that's not what we have here, but we are teaching the fundamentals of composing with different concepts that are, that are other than writing a melody or, or writing from a harmonic bass, which we all know requires a, quite a great deal of theoretical knowledge and is not something that students are comfortable with right from the get go. Jody, it's brilliant. You know, I, I see application. I see application of fundamental knowledge. So we can do the B flat scale at the beginning of every rehearsal and have rote memory, or we can apply that knowledge and have the student's agency come forward. Mm -hmm. I, I'm seeing adaptation. Every single student doesn't have to jump through the same hoop. And mm -hmm. this is a way for the student to design their own hoop and then jump through it with that level of agency. Oh, wow. You know, but I, I could see, you know, it, it takes courage. It takes courage to want to do this with yes. our beginning ensembles. It, it does. And but the reason I really wanted to focus from day one, I really wanted this resource to start at day one of band. And the reason I wanted to do that is because you can change the culture and you can change it over two or three years by by starting with your next beginner band you could start it next summer and you could say this is what we this is what we're going to do we, we're going to do this and we're going to build it with our, our next new group of students who don't know any different and guess what those students might come from an elementary training of off Schulberg so they might already have that in their elementary and then you're building a bridge and making a more continued music education for that child. If they're doing an Orschulwerk or a Kadai, um, 
approach, which, which a lot of people are using now, or even a John Fiera brand, if they're doing that in the very early child, childhood, um, that, that that's the pedagogy that they're using. And so you're actually building on this pedagogy and you're, you're transforming it. You're slowly morphing them into that world of ban rather than saying, we're going to forget everything you've done for the last five years and bang, here's a method book. You're going to read everything and you'll, you'll never get to be creative or, 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 or anything. So, you know, it's, um, that's, it's just, yeah. Uh, John was a previous guest on this series. Ah, right, uh, yeah. So we, we, we've talked about it and, and now he, he such an ambassador for the work that we're doing. He 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 lives it on a daily basis. So you said it's not Mahler symphonies, and and I I understand, but I think that's the beauty of Thirteen Moons is that yes, this is where it starts, but this isn't where it ends. Can you tell us a little bit about that project and how this is equally as important for our top level ensembles at all levels? Yes, Thirteen Moons. I, I'll, I'll admit it right here, right now. It scares me a bit. You know, <laughs> um, in 2017, I went to the Summer Music Institute at the University of British Columbia and worked with the amazing Rob Taylor. Um, Rob, Rob is uh, another author on the Horizon Leans Forward, but also just a remarkable band director who really keeps creativity alive in his very, very top ensembles. If you haven't seen any of the work that he's doing, go and find their YouTube channel and go and see some of the clips that they have been doing. Even in the time of COVID, he has been doing absolutely spectacular stuff. He's really at the forefront of things. So I was very fortunate to hook up with Rob. Again, shine your line, light bright and, and you find your people, you know. So here we are at the Summer Music Institute with a bunch of students who don't know each other who have come together, all sort of late high school is, is where they are. And there were some adults in the group as well. And I had this 13 Moons resource, which had been commissioned by the University of British Columbia conducting symposium. Their, their conducting symposium group had commissioned this and a couple of other works. And I really didn't know how I was going to teach it. I, I'd formulated what it was, but I thought, I really just don't know what I'm going to do. And for the first time ever, I thought, you know what? I'm just going to back myself. I, I, I'm, I'm a good educator. I know what I'm doing. I'm going to have a ton of different resources around me that I think I might use. And I'm just going to go with it. I'm not going to script anything. I'm not going to write anything out. I'm just going to go with it and see where it takes us. And for the first time ever in my life, I went into a state of flow whilst teaching. I actually didn't think that was possible. And at the end of the very first day, we we're at three o'clock. My time during the Summer Music Institute was 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. We all know how tough that time is. Brain switch off. You know, we finished school. It's time to eat sugar. You know, <laughs> you know that, that's what that time of day says to, to most of us. But here we were and you'd be one, two minutes to five and I'd have had students on the edge of their seats, ah, desperate to share their next idea as to where we were going next. And two hours would just go. And I remember at the end of the first day, a colleague, because there were some teachers there um, observing what I was doing. And a really good friend of mine, Chris Ward, came and put his arm around me and just said, what was that? <laughs> I went, I don't know. <laughs> and it, I thought, oh my, oh my goodness, you know, but we didn't start just with here, let's, let's play the scale. Let's look at this. We actually did some moving together. We actually did a lesson that I call Memphis Soul Stew, which teaches students about texture and it's in Bella Sun Woman, exactly how to do that lesson. Um, so I had to warm them up. I had to make them aware that we were going to break things apart a bit. I had to get them to connect as an ensemble and I had to develop that trust you know, in a pretty quick time frame, I had a, I, I had six days to work with these students, not a year. So, you know, yeah, they're in a camp situation, so they're going to come a little bit more free, free and open anyway. But, you know, we're, we're in a pretty major building in a pretty major space. But here I am with over um, over 80 kids or something in this massive, massive circle. And we made all, all these things happen. We even had students in, in the band who didn't even um, understand English very well. 
but they are able to communicate with us through movement and um, all sorts of different things. So what happened over the course of that week was this incredibly powerful, powerful experience of composition. Um, one of the ladies in the, uh, one of the adults was a lady in the flute section and she said, Jodie, I have to tell you this, last night, because she was living on campus with the students, you know, I was brushing my teeth in the girls' bathroom and there were three girls there having a stand-up argument about how we should voice a particular section of our composition of 13 moons. <laughs> now, if that isn't contextualization, I don't know what is. So it meant so much to them. Um, but there was a lot of things I learned in that week, in that, in that very first experience. I have to share with you now, that was the first movement. That's the simplest movement. And I did that with senior high schoolers. Um, you know, there was so much that we could just do with the first movement of it because there's four movements and they go uh, north, east, south and west. And the reason that there are these four compass points is because the commission asked me to really link with um, First Nations education principles uh, of Canada. And one of the big things in there was mentoring and one of the really big things in there was um, uh, just this just this desire to to really work with each other and 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 keep people uh, safe and connected. So I wanted to make sure that there were four different levels that bands of any standard could could approach this. But it's a real scope and sequence, and you can see the scope and sequence on my website of how how it folds. Um, so we had that really mesmerizing and explosive experience in that first week and UBC have since their concert wins just this past year did the last movement they did um, 13 moons west and there were three students in that ensemble who were at that summer music institute in 2017 um, and they took the material from 13 moons west so by the time you get to west um, you don't have, I think it's in a major key, concert B flat, and then we go into a minor key for East, and you can work in rounds, and there's an accompanying figure. By the time you get to South, you're working in A and B sections, um, and you're really starting, you can work in rondo forms and bring those kind of things in. By the time you get to West, it's in whole tone scales, and it's all about leap motive, and it's all about character. So there's a human theme, an animal theme, and a nature theme and and you can build around these stories um and so what uh ubc concert wins did was they actually had composers in the ensemble and they created a fourth theme which was the theme of the machine and they did this whole thing about the impact of of humans on the planet so that's what their whole story was and they took that set of material into an 18 minute full on concert piece, um, a really significant major work. They sang, um, there was all these solo mov movements. And um, if you look at the video that's on my website of this, of this remarkable performance, it starts with about five minutes of students talking about their experience in, in, in creating this piece. And uh, I think one of the most overwhelming statements to me was at a time during COVID when I should be feeling more isolated and disconnected from my, from my friends and my ensemble than, than ever, I actually feel more connected to them than I ever have done before. And that's because they got to create together. That's because they maintained safety, even in an online environment. Everyone was heard, everyone could make a contribution and again, we, we reached this, we create, they created a, a magnificent ecosystem. Um, Kristen Reed and McLennan, she was the um, band director. And, you know, they created something that I didn't even think was possible. Just absolutely, absolutely extraordinary. And, you know, and everyone who has done this um, have come back with the same kind of feedback that as they go through that creative process, yes, it gets uncomfortable. And we talked about this last time when, when we had the Horizon team here, that sometimes learning is uncomfortable, but it's in those uncomfortable moments that we learn the most. It, it's, when, it's when we take romance to that, 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 that real edge and, and when we go, wow, this really isn't working, you know, but it's in there that we find, that we find what really does work and we find out a lot about each other. And, uh, 
yeah, what, uh, you know, I had a school in Taiwan. They, they did some remarkable, remarkable things with the material. And what I love about it is that the creativity of our students is just, it's, it, it hasn't been hampered by society yet. And it's so fresh and it's so amazing that they will come up with ideas that you'll just stand there and go, wow, <laughs> I would never have thought of that, you know. And I'm, I'm saying that no, I composed the thing, you know. <laughs> so it's, um, it's, yeah, it's a really, it's a really extraordinary thing that I think will only continue to grow with multiple different reiterations. I'm very, very proud of the courage of, of band directors for really taking it on and standing back and allowing their students to just just take it on. Your words uh, of, of that testimony of, of the student who said that they feel more connected now and it's because it was creative. You know, one of my favorite phrases is safely uncomfortable. You yeah. know, being comfortable isn't the best thing. That usually means that we're pretty bored and yeah. that when we're safely <laughs> uncomfortable, then that's where the spark happens. That's where that magic happens. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree with you more. And that, that phrase really does encapsulate a lot of this kind of approach to learning that, you know, let's, let's make sure people are safe. Let's make sure that they are. Yeah. But I, I want students in my rehearsal to be sitting on the edge of their chair, you know, really, really ready to, to take things on board um, and ready to contribute and listening and invested um, rather than sitting there going, okay, let's play it again. You know, gee, I, you know, I wonder what we're going to do in maths next period, you know? Um, so, yeah. You, you know, the, the phrase that we're, we're working through and, and thinking through deeply is, are we more invested in engagement or empowerment? You know, yeah. I, yes, our, our students are going to be engaged as we go through in a more, I'll use the word traditional model, uh, but are they empowered? And, and to me, everything you're talking about, Jody, is all about the students embracing that power that's inside of them. If only we give them space for it to shine. Mm -hmm. That's right. We've got to give them space. It's, it's so important. You know, I want to share this. I, I really should know the author of this book. It was a book when my, I read when my daughter was two and it was about, you know, dealing with toddlers. And I think it was called the Toddler Whisperer or something like that. But she had this great acronym. And it's something that if, if people want to take this on, then live by this acronym because it's what I live by. And it's for the world help. You know, if, if we want to help our students, then we have to hold back, encourage, limit and praise. And the goal here is to praise when praise is due. No, none of this false praise. You know, don't, don't go. And for the toddler, it was, you know, they they do it they do a wee in the in the in the toilet or something and you and you go ballistic and you go crazy and you know you get balloons and you know and and the toddler sitting there looking at you going what is your problem you know <laughs> like what is wrong with you uh, that's a bit over the top and it's the same thing with teaching if you're going to praise make sure the praise is measured and make sure the praise is given exactly where it needs to go and that doesn't necessarily and as we all know it doesn't mean for the best. It means praising, praising growth. It means uh, praising effort. And it means, you know, pra praising those who are willing to take risk, you know, and, and be safely uncomfortable. That praise and, and, and all of those varied incarnations of success, that there's not one definition of success. Jody, I have one final question for you, and, and I, I know this is deep in your heart, and this is kind of a continuation from our last conversation with the Horizons team. And I, I've heard you talk about eras, that we are in an era in mm -hmm. education, an era in our band culture. So I would love to hear just a little bit of your thoughts about what era we are in now, and if you <laughs> had all the magic in the world and all the inspiration in the world, What's the next era? What should that next era be? I really believe, great question, Scott. Thank you for asking it. Um, I really believe we are at the end of, uh, of the era of competition, of the, um, uh, you know, it's been, uh, this year is 100 years since the very first school band competition um, in, in the US. And 
I, I am not, I don't want anybody to think that I am criticising anything that's happened in the last hundred years. It had to happen the way that it did to build what we have. And I, I think it's magnificent. You know, we, we're so incredibly fortunate that we have what we have. But it's so important now for us to remain relevant. It's just so, so important now for us to um, keep bands connected with advances in education, keep bands connected with research and, and, and new techniques in um, education. And music education has so often been at the cutting edge of that and everybody catches up. My fear for bands at the moment is that they're staying in some very, very traditional teaching and pedagogical methodologies and uh, people are then starting to question their relevancy, their relevancy to the child, their relevancy to education itself. So I really see us and I think the, the push into diversity could, we can't say that it will, but it could be the game changer that we have here. And I, and I think um, we've been in this world of, we've been, we're in transitioning, you know, you don't, it didn't suddenly go from the classical period to the romantic period. There was about 20 years in there where it took a while for things to, to really move and shift. Um, and I really feel like that we're right at the moment in the middle of that, in the middle of that shift. Uh, and, you know, it probably takes a pandemic to, to really, to really cause uh, people to sit back and go, hang on a minute, okay, this isn't going to work anymore. We're, we're going to have to do something different. Uh, I think, you know, we've played the same sounding music, the same kind of music. We've been teaching the same skill set for a very, very long time. And I think we've now learned through research, a lot of, a lot of hard-earned research from a lot of people out there who have gone and done their masters and doctorates and researched different things, that we're better conductors um, and as a result of being better conductors and better educators who are, are much more intelligent with what we're doing, um, then we need our, the music and what we're teaching to be more intelligent. We actually need the resources that we're offering our beginner kids to be more intelligent. We can't just keep dumbing it down anymore. A student, you know, I've, I've got a student, for example, in my year 12 class at the moment, and he really is only a first or second grade piano player. But at the moment, he's, he's playing a Chopin Nocturne number two. How is he doing that? He doesn't really have the skill set. He's learning it on YouTube. He's, you know, there, there's a lot of problems with, with trying to get him to improve and perfect that because he can't read music. Here's a kid learning Chopin Nocturne number two who can't read music and he's learning it off YouTube. We need to wake up and see that this is the new era. This is, it's the era of learn, teach yourself. It's the era of Pinterest boards. It's the era of, um, you know, so many things being shown how to do that the teacher's role is changing. And we, we need to move with that. We need to go with that. And we need to be part of that. And we need to, you know, get on the surfboard and ride that wave rather than being eaten by sharks in the middle of it, you know. <laughs> um, uh, uh, so, you know, I think, it's, I think it's really important that we not only embrace diverse repertoire and, and diver diversity goes so far beyond our biology. And I, I can't say that enough. Yes, it's very important that the music we play represents the students that we teach and represents the world population, not just the American population, but the population of the whole entire world. Yes. That is incredibly important. But let's make sure that that music still doesn't all sound the same. Let's make sure that all that music still isn't formulaic writing. Let's make sure that that tenor saxophone player isn't still sitting there playing those same boring parts, you know. Um, so I think it's we're moving into an era. And as you said, if I had a magic wand, what would it look like? Well, for our starters, we do a lot more music. <laughs> uh, arts, arts would have endless, endless budget, um, and and students would be allowed to uh, explore. There would be a lot more pastoral care. There would, there would be a lot more individualised, personal attention to students to really help work out where they're going, and that's what social and emotional learning is starting to enable and and help. 
um, in our everyday classrooms, not just, oh, here's pastoral care. That means in every, every other class we can forget about the welfare of the child, you know. Um, so I think if I could wave a magic wand, I'd really love to see schools just embrace creativity and learning through creativity in everything that they do, just in, in absolutely everything that they do and and really recognize the research that is out there in terms of how how the brain really learns stuff and restores stuff i'd also really love people to understand and this is a bit left field but i'm going to say it anyway the real impact of what we eat and how that impacts our our mental health the whole uh, mood and food movement is something i just feel like I'm, I'm living in this world at the moment where i see all these truths I know all these things to be true, they're all evidence-based and there's been such a wealth of research about all these, of the way we can be really well and be really kind and nurturing and connected human beings. And I feel like I'm living on a planet that just doesn't seem to want to take on board any of that. You know, in our education systems, we still want to be focused on the standardised test results. In, in, in our health, we, we're just, as our, whole medical industry that just wants you to take a pill instead of actually looking at what you're putting inside your body on a daily basis and what that how that is impacting who you are and then on top of that we know hands down that music is the most important and powerful thing that we can have in our education system in terms of neuro, the development of neuroplasticity and in terms of social and emotional wellness and, and we're treating it like dirt under our feet. So I'd flip all of those things over if, you know, if, if I could, and I think it would be a much happier and much safer and much kinder planet. Jody, we need to get you that magic wand. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, w w when you say this, I think you have every person listening going out to getting a surfboard now because yeah. we want to ride those waves and we want to, we, we want to explore this. And, and the magic about that is the ocean has a mind of its own. We can't control the ocean. That's right. That's we can right. just keep our heads above water and appreciate the majesty of it. Mm, that's right. And yeah, we've, we've got to learn to, we've got to learn to swim with the sharks. We've got to be aware that those sharks are going to be there regardless of what we do. Um, and you've got to pick your battles, you know, you've got to decide what days are you going to surf and what days is it, is it better to stay on shore? You know, I appreciate it's, it's, it's hard. It's a really tough situation at the moment. And I think we're in a, I think we're talking about, um, eras. I think we're in an era where, um, it, it, it's hard. It's really hard right now, but at some point it's going to crack. And at some point that pendulum is going to shift back towards the arts and and we you know um we, we're going to see people waking up just going wow this really isn't working you know there's there aren't any more mental health providers there there aren't any more counselors we have a, an entire generation of anxiety you know what's going wrong why is this happening and then maybe then we'll we'll wake up and go well putting students in this test this constant testing environment is one of the worst things you can possibly do to generate anxiety. So we, you know, at, at some point we're going to come back and say, hey, education isn't about the top 10%. Education is about growing a human being into being a thinking, feeling, kind and generous soul. And we've, we've really lost our way with that. And I really hope that, you know, we can keep music alive and all, all we can do, rather than feel overwhelmed by it, because it can be incredibly overwhelming, is to say, what can I do today? What can I do today for the students that I see? What can I give them that maybe they're not going to get somewhere else? And maybe what I can give them is uh, a piece of creative joy. Maybe I can um, have them walk into a space which is incredibly safe and nurturing. Maybe I can give them a space where they feel like they can be their whole self. Uh, maybe I can, you know, shine a light on somebody who just never gets a light shined on them, you know, and make that make that child feel valued. So that's I think that's that's our that's our job as music educators is to not think about 
winning the next competition. It's not thinking about, you know, we've got to get that, you know, the trumpets still aren't playing that, that line correctly. You know, I think in the next one to two years, can we just relax on some of that? And, and can we actually really think about the, the people behind the instruments? And Jody, I think there's no better time. You know, we, we've come through so much. Uh, I'll give you just a very quick story that mm -hmm. I was doing some professional learning uh, at the Ravinia Festival here in Chicago, just a beautiful, beautiful space, was working with some of their wonderful teaching artists. And we were getting ready to do some mindful breathing to set our stage to really get our minds right where we needed to be to be open to learning. And the production team, who are the best in the business, I love them, they do great work. They were testing the speakers and what comes over the speakers? Carmina Burana. And it was yeah. just like, oh, nothing like centering. But you know, at the moment, <laughs> do, we, do we get frustrated? Mm. We've been through too much to get frustrated over a little bit of ORF coming over some speakers. <laughs> Uh, look, it's, um, yeah, it, it can just be incredibly infuriating because we, because I think what we're seeing now is we're getting more and more generations of adults who have not had a particularly good music education. So they're becoming less and less sensitive or aware as to what we're actually doing as music educators in schools. Um, and the job's just, it's just getting harder and harder. So relevancy, keeping things relevant and contextualized is more important than ever and realizing that when we put the student at the center that yeah. relevancy is front and center for us yeah. yeah jody just unbelievable the resources you've given us that you've talked us through and and the inspiring words have been a gift to the profession and i i truly believe that the things that you spoke about today are the path to bring in the new era the path that we are going to get there so on behalf of everyone who's listening, uh, thank you so much for the hard work you're doing and stay tuned because Jody and I are gonna be working together and coming up with some really great musical SEL intersections coming up here. Jody, thank you so much. Have a great night. Can't wait. Great, thanks Scott. <laughs> Music for All's mission is to create, provide and expand positively life-changing experiences through Music for All. Our vision is to be a catalyst to ensure that every child across America has access and opportunity to participate in active music making in their scholastic environments. I want to thank Jody Blackshaw, who gave us tangible tools to jump on a surfboard, to take it to the next level and start a new era in music education. I'd like to thank our national presenting sponsor, the Yamaha Corporation of America. Be sure to check out the Yamaha Educator Suite at yamahaeducatorsuite.com. And I would like to thank GIA Publications for their continued support. Before we say goodbye, we are extremely grateful for any donations gifted to our nonprofit organization. If you enjoyed today's program, and in order for us to continue to provide our free educational resources and advocacy materials, please consider gifting to Music for All in any amount. Please visit musicforall.org give. For Music for All, I'm Scott Edgar. Thank you. 